So I am sitting here with the man behind Shaolin Cowboy. Uh, the new issue, Shaolin Cowboy, Cruel to Be Kin Number One, is out now. It's Jeff Darrow. Jeff, thanks for talking to me. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Anthony. Thank you for inviting me to uh, spend a little of your valuable time with me. So in, in preparation for this conversation, I went back and reread all of Shaolin Cowboy, from the Burly Man stuff to the new number one. And reading everything in quick succession, it was fascinating seeing the like the progression of the series and the art and, and the storytelling. Has your approach to doing Shaolin Cowboy changed, you know, from series to series? Uh, not really. I just, it's just, I don't know, I guess I think of things or see things a different way as I get older. And, you know, I mean, I just try to get better, learn something and I get ideas like, oh, well, I could do that this way. And, uh, That's cool. But I, it's not a conscious thing in terms of. Well, do, do you do you consciously or subconsciously think that you bring in any different influences? Because I know, you know, early on, you definitely you were influenced by Mobius, who is you know a friend and collaborator of yours, and Akira Kurosawa films. It's very you know that's all very obvious in in the work. As it went on, did you kind of bring in different, you know, whether it's movies or creators or ideas? <laughs> Not really. They're it's still pretty much the same. The stuff that I like. I mean, uh, uh, there is, as you mentioned, there's uh, Mobius and uh, Otomo, and uh, even though it might not seem uh, evident, uh, Jack Kirby. And uh, oh, it's uh, evident. It's definitely evident. I wasn't sure. I mean, uh, I mean, I, the guy had just a imagination that I don't think. Uh, a planet could contain but uh and i mean movies i mean there's just a lot of the movies that, that i like the you mentioned kurosawa and a japanese director named kenji misumi who directed a lot of well he directed probably people know the baby cart movies but he directed this, all, a lot of the zatoichi movies and i, I like the uh, chinese director um, producer Choi hark and yun wo ping and um uh, I've had great affection for Sergio Leone and uh, a lot of the Italian westerns. Uh, especially there was there's one that not many people know, but I grew up in Iowa and I didn't see this the the, the Clint Eastwood westerns until after I'd seen these kind of ripoff movies called The Stranger, who's basically Tony Anthony, which is basically you know the, the man with no name character, and uh, there's a bit of an homage to to that 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 uh, that series are like three or four films and uh also like uh quite a bit jimmy wang Yu, who did this he did the one-armed swordsman and uh did one really famous film called uh, well, famous uh, master of the flying guillotine which is a very very odd movie with a really odd soundtrack it was i think it was a german techno music from like the 70s and it was really whenever the this master of the flying guillotine would show up, they'd play this. It's just like a sound like steam. He's like, <laughs> and he would cut somebody's head off at this thing. And there's quite the homage to that in there but, uh, coming up. But oh, I'm I'm glad I'm recording this because I'm just gonna go back and write down everything you just said. Give myself a little watch list of all of these. Yeah, yeah if you can catch, I mean, especially not many people know this guy Kenji Masumi, but he was just. The, the guy must have did three or four films a year. He'd like do two Zatoichis and his sense of composition was just amazing. I mean, for as fast as they, they and you could see he influenced a lot of the, the Hong Kong films. You could see that they were all kind of looking at his stuff. Um, but you know, he's a brilliant director. Not many, unfortunately, not many people know. Even in Japan, when I was living in Tokyo, I'd mentioned Kenji Masumi and they'd be like, hmm. but the guys that were, older than me all knew oh you know Kenji Masumi they all knew him well as far as Shaolin Cowboy goes again reading them all back to back you can see that each one kind of picks up directly where the previous one leaves off and yet each series feels like very accessible in its own right do you how much thought do you put into keeping each series new new reader friendly or do you give that any thought I I, I can't say that I give it that much thought I mean to be honest the first one which which is what Burley Man did. I was never able to finish that. There's like a there's a whole section of that that I wasn't able to do. And when when Dark Horse started printing it, 
the book called Shep Buffet. It's kind of like what happened after that, but much later, because there was a whole, because in the first series, there was this talking mule and I've never addressed, there's a whole, whole. I was curious about the mule. I was very curious about the mule. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring him back, but in a very, very kind of odd way. But um, actually, if you read, Shem Buffet, and you've read the next one, which is Who Will Stop the Rain, and then this one, they are connected uh, in a very, very kind of small way, but it becomes obvious in the third one. Uh, there's a okay. kind of payoff to what happens in the first one. Okay. And uh, something that I really love about Shaolin Cowboy is that it's it's bonkers, right? It's insane and awesome, and he's doing nunchucks with dogs with knives for paws, and it's just awesome i don't know i don't know how you come up with that stuff but there's also like a bunch of subtext and, and commentary social commentary political commentary but it's largely in the setting in the background you know graffiti and billboards and and, and stuff why why that approach as opposed to a more direct one to because even like the world design this american wasteland dystopia like it's it's very present, but it's not like directly addressed. Like, why? Why did you go that way? Um, and how much of like that commentary and graffiti and stuff is planned out in advance, and how much of it is just your brain throwing it's it on planned, the page? A lot of it, it's it's not planned. That I go, oh, I'm going to have this on this on this page, but uh, a lot of it is. Um, I to be. I I never wanted to address things that, that bother me and that, that I'm concerned about, but I never want to have the thing stop and have like what they do in movies sometimes and stop and look at the camera and go, you know, you know, the reason like, I was, this is the reason I do this because blah, 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 blah. And he gives some reason for, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I like the idea that if you see him do something, his actions explain his, his motivation. His, uh, uh, and I, I just like that. Because people don't do that, they don't, you know, he meets these people and makes these creatures or whatever, and they're not going to stop and say, you know, I really didn't like the Second Amendment, or I do like the Second Amendment, they're going to, you know, I say, yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that in this world, the Second Amendment has kind of taken over, because, I mean, if you look around, nearly, it's an amazing, even those baby carriages, they have guns in them, I mean, everybody has guns, I mean, and it kind of started in the hard because they came up with this idea, because I'd visited Japan, and you can find anything in a vending machine. And I mean anything, underwear and alcohol. I always think that if, if you could, in, in America, if there was a vending machine that had alcohol in it, it wouldn't last an hour once the sun went down. It would just be, whereas in Japan, you know, it's like, then people aren't going to do it. But I did this, this one page where there's a vending machine and you can get guns in a vending machine. And that's when I kind of started playing with, with that idea. Because then it's funny that you could get guns anywhere. And Shaolin, guns... Lot, like three things available, like uh, alcohol, guns, and porn. And because uh, I did, I made a trip once up to, I think it was into Wisconsin, and I was just struck by the fact that on this on the road, the thing, three things you could buy, they had cheese, guns, and porn. And I, and I just always kind of made me, made me laugh to think it, you know, honey, we got enough porn. I don't know, maybe we better <laughs> porn, pick up some porn, you know, and oh, we get to get some cheese, go with that porn. Well, there's plenty of cheese in porn. Well, not the kind we can eat. Well, it depends on anyway. And, and guns and, and rather than fireworks too, but it always kind of cracked me up. So I kind of I kind of play with that. But that's that Midwestern hospitality. <laughs> yes, indeed. Hospitality <laughs> being the key word. But, but yes, but I just thought it, you know, I could I think people can see my politics from uh, from from what I've I've drawn in the background without I mean if I don't think you don't you have to really notice it if you don't want to if it no i don't i don't think you do like i said it's, it's you know if you don't really sit and, and think like how and why the world turned out the way that it did you could just kind of take it at face value but i think it's really fun like looking and and thinking well how did that world come about uh yeah but, I, I, I always had my own ideas about it but i was just never going to explain it make sure i don't think i don't think you need to I, I think it's great. Yeah, oh. I, I know this like over here in because I live in France. Over here in France, they've noticed it and they, they will bring it up when they talk to me. In America, I heard I don't always have people that say, you know, uh, notice that stuff. And uh, I mean, because there's so much 
action and violence. That's what people tend to notice. And right. Understandably so. Hmm. Well, in terms of all of like the, the background stuff and the detail, obviously you, you put an incredible amount of detail into, you know, your artwork. Uh, on, on average, how long would you say it takes you to draw a Shaolin cowboy issue? I don't know if you draw it issue to issue or if you draw the whole thing and then break it up later. But just uh, like this one, I mean, every I've said this a gazillion times, but I'm going to repeat it. I I always think, well, I'm going to I'm going to draw an issue and then ink it and then move on to the next one. But I always end up drawing, getting it done. When I've got the drawing thing, kind of seems to be moving okay. So just another couple pages in the next one and then and in this case this latest one I kept doing it and and I didn't stop and I went and I never have and I went up to 205 pages and then I had to ink the whole thing and that just about wow, I was like oh my god it was like count and I go because the first page is the splash page with the city and I go I dreaded having to ink that thing after having drawing it and I go oh, and I, when I get once I get that one out of the way I'll be fine and then it was like, I don't know, the second one. And then I thought, well, once they get under 200 pages, I'll feel like I accomplished something. And then it was like to 175. And then when then I was counting the issues. And then you're like, oh, once they get under 100, I'll be, you know. And it was, it was, because it just, as it goes on, it just gets worse. I mean, because the, the last three, last three issues, he's back in the city. And that stuff, you know, windows and people and cars and, it's, you know, it's like, why did I draw all this stuff? That's so funny. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about that first page, actually, of the city you know, that yeah. opens Cruel to be Kin, because it's, you know, it's breathtaking. And my, my friend and partner, Matt Sardo, who, who I run this website with, he <laughs> was, he, it blew his mind. He was like, I could stare at this for days. So this oh. is, this is, this is one of his questions. Uh, like, could you just speak a little bit about like the thought process in, in orchestrating that page and you know the the height and the angle and the depth of field and stuff like that and like why that why you chose that to open cruel to begin and how you well, kind of I, I always think you should let the reader know where you're at and kind of what kind of world it is i don't know i don't know that does it i mean i imagine people i think well if they've seen the comic they know kind of what it is but i thought i always like to have like an establishing shot and um i like drawing buildings even though i have after I've done it, I'm like, oh, why the hell did I do this? Because I like to be able to like draw little things like, uh, uh, you know, like little plastic giant figures that are on top of a building promoting cola or religion or God and just tiny little figures and then down in the street. So it looks like, you know, it's like a real, like a real place. And in this case, I go, I got to have one sort of a big thing. And I'll have this cat who's got knows how many stories up in the air walking on the, on the, on the the, the edge of the building and uh you know I, I always find that like doing a down shot you know and it's in the two points perspective and i mean i cheat because i mean it should be you know three point but i i something i kind of, kind of picked up from mobius and i think even otomo does it i, I don't do the three point very often because it's it's so it's so much work and the two seems to it seems to look okay and uh you know i just also, the idea that I, when he goes to this town, it's supposed to be kind of a small town in, uh, in the fictional version of, uh, I don't call it Texas, I call it Tex is. Yeah. Some call it Tex ass. But, uh, uh, and I, I love people at Texas. I, there's some of them I really don't agree with. But uh, so, so that references the people that, you know, the, the Gomerts and the uh, you know the, the goofball governor and some of those people, but uh, I, I, I so I thought this that is a small town in Texas. That's my joke, and it's gigantic. It's actually giant, but that for me they go that's a small town in Texas. I don't know that anybody, I don't know that anybody will get that joke, but that that was. So I don't have to explain. It. I said, well, I explain, oh, I explain it to you that uh, this small town in Texas is like a. Well, every, everything's bigger in Texas, even the small towns. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I like it. Do you, especially now that we're like in, in a, you know, everything's getting more and more digital and people read a lot more digitally. Do you give any thought to the fact that people are going to be like able to zoom in and focus on every deep? No, you don't even think about that. Oh, well, it does. And it terrifies me oh. because I think, I think I look at it and go, God, 
it looks okay if you don't look at it too close. <laughs> You're blown up, oh, this guy, what a loser. You know, oh, the, you know, the flower pot on this window, the, the ellipse on it is all crappy. And oh, this bird here, oh man, the, the one wing is too big, the other's too, I just think they're fine. They'll be able to literally just take it to pieces like they got nothing better to do with their time. Although I've had people come up to me and especially in France, someone come to me, you know, you do that train in the page one. I said, yes. On the second page, it has only five windows, and in the page prior, it has six. And I'm like, man, you got way too much time on your hands. <laughs> if you can count the windows on this goddamn train, which is like, you know, like an inch long, it was like, oh, it's like he had me. It was like some journalistic, uh, you know, yeah. uh, muckraking uh, guy that's like, I've got that Daryl now. <laughs> oh. Hey, if that's if that's the worst thing they can bust you on, you're doing okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you to say? Um, so something I thought was really cool about this new number one, Cruel to Be Kin, was that you tell the whole story, or at least this issue, from the perspective of a Komodo dragon, yeah. which, you know, it's cool having like that singular, you know, POV in an issue. Uh, where did, where did that idea come from to for the Komodo dragon to tell the story from the Komodo dragon's perspective, as opposed well, to like a more, you know, third party? I was watching, I don't know, I think it was couldn't have been the Discovery Channel because that's all pawnbrokers and repairing cars station thing, unless it's Shark Week. I mean, National Geographic, and they had a, a, a thing on the, the island, and it's Komodo Island, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, I don't remember, in Indonesia, I think. And they're talking about, you know, how the, you know, the mother, the mother, the female Komodo dragon lays its clutch of eggs in a blah, 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 but it must remain, uh, aware because the male will <laughs> will eat the young as soon as it's born to to keep the competition and the the food source in abundance so i got wow it's, it's like she's got to watch her own baby so the dad doesn't eat them and i thought that was like wow and and uh i worked worked a lot with the late andrew vax about the child, who does a lot of child protection and uh really really amazing amazing and dear man and he would talk about family of choice and how just because you're born with a family that doesn't love you, you can find another one. And uh, it always stuck in my head. And, and I thought, what if I, <laughs> I wonder, I don't know, I don't want to even think about now, what if I did a story about, you know, there's these dragons that they eat their young and, and he kind of rescues them and uh, sort of without, you know, being too. I'm explaining it. I, I don't mean to explain it, actually, but that if that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah. So, no. Absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm very intrigued to see where it goes. I've always been fascinated with Komodo dragons. What yeah, yeah. It? It's, it's, they're amazing. I mean, it, you know, like I know they were used to talk. I used to think it was because if you got bit by one, you get these horrible, you know, bacteria that, that they used to they used to think it was from because they don't really have their teeth. They get a lot of the food gets caught in it and it gets rotten and then figure well you get that that poison but it's actually they 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 manufacture like it's toxic stuff that i think helps break down the food once it gets into their stomach and i don't think they like i had an alligator for 25 years and they they don't digest it just lies in there it just kind of like decomposes and the body takes what it needs and the rest comes out the other end when you say you had an alligator like as a pet you had a pet alligator yeah wow. for 25 years yeah, yeah. i Arnold. live I live in Florida, unfortunately, and I even I don't have I, I don't have pet pet. Oh, I, when, uh, I I've never... those, when I watch those things and people are like, I'm not scared of them at all because I mean I had this thing and I know what you can and you can't do with them and what you got to be careful of. And mine actually came from Louisiana, and he was an actual alligator. There used to play, used to be a place in Louisiana called the Louisiana Biological Center, and you could order anything from these guys. I'm not sure if possibly even poisonous snakes. And you could buy an alligator by the foot. And uh, my, I was so bad in school, and I loved dinosaurs. And God, I thought people in Florida were just so lucky because they go, you just go in their backyard and find an alligator wherever they want. And, um, and my dad found this place, and he said, look, if you get good grades <laughs> this year, I'll get you an alligator. And I barely scraped by because I get like, if I got a C, I felt like I was the best. And I think I got c's and then a couple d's which which and he got me this alligator and we sent the money down i got a baby and it came by mail in a box 
It was inside of a box in a burlap bag when you opened it up. And as opposed to in those days at, 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 at dime stores, you could buy alligators, but they were caimans, which is a different variety. They weren't American alligators. And we, it was a real American alligator and I had it for 25 years. Wow. And he was, uh, you know, I mean, he, I knew in the winter it was a little rougher because they, they're, they're not used to the cold. And I lived in Iowa and we'd keep them in the basement and his metabolism slowed down. He wouldn't want to eat. So we'd have to force feed him. So you have to open up his mouth and like shove a, a, like a piece of fish or raw liver down his throat. So he would eat it. But I got used to, you know, we had my mother, even my mother, who was, she'd, she'd take him out of the pen and take him upstairs and leave him in the living room so he could sun himself in the living room. And uh, this, this this is like the most interesting thing I think that is going to come out of this interview. This I think so like, too. And when I, when I when I went to art school, I couldn't take him with me, so I left him with my brother. And my brother and Mary had kids, and I remember going over to see him. And I see, I look and I see a, see some movement on the corner of my eye, and I see coming out of the bedroom the alligator, and he's walking across the bedroom, heading for the bathroom, and right behind him, all fours, is his infant toddler chasing the alligator and I was like what even that I was like you know because he could still he would they he wasn't huge but he could take your finger he could take a finger off sure he would grow every time we, we increase the size of his environment he would grow to fit it and so we stopped which is you know and I, I should never have owned an alligator people shouldn't own those things but I didn't know any better but but he got to be I don't know about a yard and a half long and my brother would keep him in the bathtub. I remember my mom screaming at my brother because once again, she's over at his house and she was sitting on the bathroom and she looked over in the bathtub. She sees the alligator floating at the water looking at her. I would, I'd have a heart attack. Yeah, well, yeah but like I say, she, she used to really go and get him. She was just like, sure. you know, like, what do you got that thing in there? You know, the kids could get yeah. a bit by it. But he was, uh, we put him outside in the, in the yard and he'd sleep out there and like birds like crows would just line up on the wire the telephone wires and they'd dive bomb him because it was like what the fuck is this thing i don't know they thought that this alligator was going to climb the tree and like uh -huh. steal their eggs and he just didn't bother him at, at all and we had a dog as well that the dog one time kind of tried to bite the alligator and the alligator kind of nipped him on the nose and after that they just kind of kept their distance and there was never another uh, thing my alligator story hmm. I don't even oh, tell you about the things we used to try feeding them. That could, that's something. I'm afraid it, to even ask. Yeah, one, one involved a bat, and I won't even go into that. But you got to, got little, got to leave them wanting more. There needs to be some mystery to more, the more alligator stories. Uh, well, I was gonna ask you about what it's like choreographing a fight with a Komodo dragon and like the kind of thought and research that needs to go into that. But it seems like you might have like an intimate knowledge of reptiles. Well, not really. I mean, I just, you know, actually that, uh, I, you know, I didn't think about it at the time, but I, cause in the second book, uh, you see Komodo dragons on the rooftops every once in a while too. And my whole idea was like, well, I gotta do something. Why are those Komodo dragons there? And I kind of explained it in this one. And, uh, and then I thought, well, uh, I remember I was working on the Matrix and the, the, one, the art director at the time named Hugh Beta, they talked about, well, why don't you do me a drawing? I want you to do a t-shirt and it's a Komodo dragon that knows Kung Fu. And um, I drew him the shirt and I, and I didn't even, have a, when I started doing this thing, Komodo dragon, oh, we can have a Kung Fu fight. And I realized, oh man, that's what, you know, I got this idea from Hugh Beta. And uh, I, I said, well, it'd be great to have a fight with him. And, and so, you know, I just, you know, it's just, it came from that. I mean, when I was drawing the thing, I had no idea that it was going to be like that. It just kind of came out. Sure. All that stuff is kind of, although it's drawn, it's kind of ad lib. I don't have it. I don't have, I don't sit down and write a script that says, and in this scene, he fights, blah, 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 Because I, I, I work, of... yeah, I, I worked with, I worked once with Jet Lee and, uh, he, I talked to him about, you know, what they do and if you know what Jet Li is. Uh, I do. How, how they choreograph that stuff with, you know, Yun Wu Ping. And I always got the idea that it's almost like the old Buster Keaton uh, movies, silent movies, where they just go into a room and they look around and they go, what can we do in here? What, 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 are they, what are the gimmicks we could use? 
And that's what I did with him because I had no idea. Like, what can I do with this dragon? He can use his tail. Oh, what if he uses his tail to steal his gun? And da, da, da. But it all comes from just kind of postulating on um, whatever, whatever, whatever is in the room or in this case, out in the desert. Sure. That's cool. That's do you, well, kind of in the same vein though, like with, with the bigger action sequences, because your, your action sequences and your fight scenes, like, you know, they flow so smooth and like, you know, they're, um, they, they, they flow well. How do you, I know you're saying you kind of improv it and kind of come up with it. So do you really give any thought in terms of like what beats and moments are essential to make it flow like that? Again, my friend Matt was curious if it's something that you were doing or if it was his brain pulling in all of like the Kung Fu movies that he had seen and the Jet Li's and stuff and kind of filling in the gaps. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'll sit down and I'll, I know that I'm going to have him fight somebody on, on, on this, on these pages. And then I, you know, I mean, there's always going to be, well, this, this should take, about, this should take about a page. And then it ends up being like five pages. And I just try to make it, you know, move and make sense as opposed to, this used to bother me when, you know, you were going to build up to, and I'm not going to name this comic book, but well, I don't I'm going to do it anyway. You, you got to fight like the death of Superman for God's sake, you know? And, uh, you know, come on, put some thought into it. I mean, it should have been really spectacular. And I, and I, don't, and I, I was like, I don't want to, I never wanted to do something like that where it's just like, you know, take advantage of the moment that should be more than just one guy throws a punch and it's all over. I know there's a limitation, they probably a limitation of space and such, but, but I just wanted to look in evol involving because that's the kind of stuff I like from watching, watching, uh, Choi Hark film, Jet Li and Jackie Chan. And, uh, I really like Yun Wu Ping. I don't know if you've seen many of his movies, but the early I'm ones. Not. I'm not, but I'm going to have to look into them after, after this conversation. He choreographed the first Matrix movie. The Wachowskis had loved his movies, which not many people had seen. And they brought him in, despite Warner Brothers, like, oh, why do you need this guy from China? Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and he went on to do the, 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 the stuff in uh, the choreography and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. But before that, he had directed the, he, he made Jackie Chan a, char, a star. He was a guy that directed The Drunken Master. And, uh, and then he went on to do these just crazy, like you can find one called Taoist Drunkard. It's amazing. It's got, right. the, the hero's kind of this buck guy that drives around in this sort of a bamboo cart that he makes. It's called like a, I think it's like a Buddha wagon. It's got like a Buddha statue in it and he pedals it. And he's got to catch this guy that he allowed to escape. That's like a some sort of vampire. You know, they didn't really quite explain it, but those his movies were just so crazy and funny, and um, full of imagination. And then he, he also uh, went on to to choreograph films for Stephen Chow, if you've seen uh, Kung Fu Hustle, which is an amazing movie. And uh, I. I, I have not seen, I'm familiar with it. I've heard of it. I've just, I need to, uh, over really the last few years. Wow, really funny stuff. I need to, over the last few years, I've been getting more uh, into like Eastern cinema. Uh, been, I'm still working my way through Kurosawa's catalog, yeah. but I, I uh, fully you got the, Have you gotten a red beard? I haven't gotten a red beard, no. That was the end of his relationship with Mafuni, but there, I won't tell you because you'll see, there's a moment in that was like, holy cow, there we go. <laughs> It's a great movie. I mean, yeah, Kurosawa. I got you. I think the next one I'm watching is High and Low. That's the next one on my list. Ed McBain. If you're familiar yeah. with Ed McBain, that's a great one. Great story yeah. about you know the value of the value of, of humanity, the price of, of what one human being is worth compared to another. Uh, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, your dialogue, because your dialogue is so, uh, it's full of references and tongue-in-cheek humor, lots of pop culture gags. Uh, how, how, what's your philosophy behind writing dialogue in your books? Is it, again, you don't, you don't, you don't like really script things out ahead of time, so how does that, how does all that come to you? Well, I just know that, you know, I, I, I have the basic idea. I just know that they're going to have to talk about this at this particular point, and uh, like, I tried, and on this one, there's a lot more of it. I try not to do have people making pithy remarks all the time, like in, you know, like uh, 
time. Like Spider-Man fighting Sandman. Well, it's time for me to put the Sandman to sleep. You know, that kind of, you know, you try not to do that too much. But I, I always like, because when I write it, I, I read it out to myself. And I, I think this sounds okay. And I just don't want it ever to sound really pretentious. And uh, and I don't know, I just, as I'm writing it, I know that the guy has to say, like, I have to go to the bathroom. And I just try to think of some clever way to have him say, I have to go to the bathroom. It's a so, very, yeah. it's a very unique voice. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it helps. Because I, mean, so I really like, and I know there's about nowhere near this quality, but I always think like, I like Tarantino's dialogue because it sounds like people talking to each other. They don't sound like, Maybe I'm wrong. I, I hope it doesn't sound too much like it's been written. I always hate when dialogue sounds written. Right. And you see, I know there's a lot of writers in comics that like, look what I wrote. And it's it's almost like they've stopped and told the audience, like, you know, you're going to hear something. You're going to read something really profound here. That's why I love, you know, I bring this up. I love Mike Mignola's dialogue too, because it's just, they talk as, as crazy as it is. They, to me, they sound, they sound normal. Mm -hmm. you know when the hellboy you know is fighting some giant goat-headed robot demon from the seventh level of hell and he hits him or he first sees him and he goes well i've never seen that before i mean just i don't know it just rings true to me yeah i i mean you know, uh, eric powell and the goons similarly yeah, yeah. like I, yeah yeah as opposed to this stygian creature must be defeated and only my right. demon claw fist can do it like, which I kind of like. I love that movies. Actually, I love to listen to old kung fu movies because they're so badly translated. Yeah, and it sounds goofy, but it's meant for me. It's funny. I, I can't take it seriously. No, it is very funny. Uh, speaking of movies, just I want to ask you real quick have Have you seen the new Doctor Strange movie by chance? No, nah, because I, I I live in the middle of nowhere, and if it's playing, and it probably is, it's dubbed. And seeing a movie yeah. dubbed, just it's just the worst. Like I. I'd worked on the Matrix 4 and I didn't see it for a few weeks because I had to wait till it played in one theater about two and a half hours away at one time in the afternoon. And uh, I went to see it. I went to see it there. And because uh, dubbed, it's just because they use a lot of the same voices. So I don't know if you've ever seen a Godzilla movie, but they're always the same voices. So they sound really goofy to me. And dubbing here, Used to be an art. Now it's just kind of like you know the same guy that does Clint Eastwood, does Vin Diesel, that does Bruce uh, Bruce Willis, and it's just like you know, it just kind of pulls you out of the experience. Sure. Well, I um, I'll never mind about the Doctor Strange because I don't want to spoil it for you. Or anybody. Some go ahead. I'd like to hear it because I mean I I don't spoilers don't bother me. Well, just to keep it light and for anyone listening or watching to this too, there's there, there's a battle in the movie where strange is fighting someone else and the music and the sound is like integral to the battle like it's built oh. into the fight like oh. it's something it's something that only could be done in a medium with audio is there anything that you've ever wanted to do in Shaolin Cowboy that you can't because you need like another element that you needs to be like in live action or film or animation or something like that no I don't I don't think so no, okay. I, I, there are always things that I, I think like I don't know if I can physically draw this but uh yeah I, no that's right i, I mean, mean that's a of comics you can draw i mean of course the sound you can and i always think yeah. i always think of i don't I, at the beginning of hard boil i have put sound effects in and then lately i even in, i think in the big guy i stopped because i thought people looking at it if i draw it okay they're going to fill that in i mean when you hit somebody and their teeth are flying out i think i can ooh, i can imagine that sound so I may be wrong, but that's that's my philosophy with, it. and I like I do like sound effects. I it's mean, a, to me, I'd put I'd put like I'd put the Japanese sound effects in there. Right. I, I don't know what they're saying, but I know they're saying something, and it just sounds it looks really cool. Sure. Yeah. It's I mean, sound is really the one hold uh, you know on, on comics, but like you said, <laughs> if if you do it right, you can hear what's happening. Well, I always wanted because I always and I almost did it in this one. I thought I'm gonna put at the bottom of each page the music that I think of when I was drawing this, like it's uh, oh, this, this little, this, this piece of music from uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, or this little piece of music from, uh, uh, from Dimitri Chomkin may have done for uh, um, Rio Bravo or something like that. And it'd, it'd work in here. And I thought about doing that kind of like making a soundtrack 
to the thing because I do like 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 the idea of that. That's so. If there's one thing in comics that I can't do is I put the music in there. there you go. Uh, well, Jeff, I got one more question for you, and then I'll let you go. We yeah. we put we put this out into the ether that we we're going to be talking with you, and we got you know so we had friends and followers and readers you know ask some questions, and by sure. far by far the most asked question it was. Can we expect to maybe see a new collaboration between you and Frank Miller now that Frank has his own publishing house? I don't know. It's up to him. I don't. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that he'd want to because uh, <laughs> I think I drove him crazy because I would go off on tangents and uh, I mean he's always describing it as trying to ride a bronco because I didn't think I just I thought well if someone says writes. You know, he fights a guy on top of a car. And well, what if it was on top of an airplane? And I mean, I just, I mean, I thought if you could come up, <laughs> if you come up with a better idea, I should do it. And I would, what I thought was a better idea. And I would do that. And he never, ever complained. But I know later I'd say, God, you know, you, you turn these things in. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? Because, you know, that's not, you know, you've, you've made this thing. Because Nixon was never, he was supposed to be human. And when I drew him and he saw it, he's like, there's no way he could survive all that damage. And I always kind of thought, it's just a comic book, man. I mean, and so he made him a cyborg so he could explain it. And then the dogs, too, the dog, I always kind of cracked me up because I draw this, I had an English bulldog and I was drawing him quite a bit in, just to fill up space in the, in the background. And he had explained that. He added the two pages. I think it's two pages at the beginning of Hard Boiled. He added after I'd finished the comic because he could, the thing with the bulldog bothered him. <laughs> so he wanted to explain it. So he turned the bulldogs into these like surveillance. Uh, they'd be like drones now. They were surveillance. So. There you go. But I don't know. I mean, he's never asked. And, you know, depends on what it is. Sure. Okay. Well, I think Jeff, good. thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your day. Well, thank you, Anthony. And uh, you got a great book collection. Thank you so much. You got great taste. <laughs>